I've been working our way through a series on difficult people. Let's be honest, who have, in your life have been difficult? I'm waiting for the rest of you. All right, and how many have ever had someone be difficult to them? Uh, so last week we did a little thing with the husbands and wives. I don't remember. I think they're all here and, 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 and still married, so that's really good. Uh, so we're going to do one a little bit different today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite all the staff uh, from Grace Church. So myself, uh, Penny, Pastor Penny, Pastor Natasha, Pastor Mariah, and future Pastor Nick. All right. So everyone has a stack of papers. And on the face, we have the face of each of us. And so we're going to go through these questions really quickly. Uh, Carol's going to read them, and we're going to answer them honestly. Believe it or not, there's five of us that work together every day, and believe it or not, some of these people are difficult. <laughs> you can decide which ones are they. And so what we're going to do is Carol's going to read the question. Carol's going to read the question. I took a lot of flack last night because I made these. And, uh, and Penny, and Penny was like, "How can you make everyone's head huge except for you have like the nicest picture ever?" Now well, maybe, maybe we should have made them. Uh, <laughs> right? My face doesn't even fit. All right. So Carol's going to read the first question, and we all answer it by holding up the face of the person. So here we go. Who is the most difficult to nail down for a meeting? <laughs> okay. This is interesting. I want to. I want to see. All right. So that was all me. Okay. Next. So who is the most difficult to get in contact with? Oh. <laughs> Nick put himself. I miss, I miss text all the time. Like, yeah. I said Penny because she never has her phone on. So who's the easiest to get along with? Uh, <laughs> oh, that one says Penny. Okay. okay, I think I know this one. Who sounds the most grumpy on the phone? Bingo. <laughs> Who is the most helpful? <laughs> oh my word. Who did what? She got her stuff. Oh sweet mercy. Okay. Who looks the most grumpy around the office? <laughs> me? <laughs> You're dead to me. <laughs> Who is the most organized? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> My son, Tasha. Yeah. I say both. It's time. <laughs> and who's the most unorganized? Oh, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> you put you? Yeah. Oh, Guys, it's totally Nick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's totally Nick. <laughs> and who is the most opinionated? Sorry. Opinionated? Opinionated? Oh, <laughs> Who makes it the most difficult to get work done because of office to office visit and check? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Who is most likely 
Take credit for your idea. Well, take credit for your idea? So that's it, folks. Well, we all can be difficult. Some more difficult than others. But we all can be difficult. Last Sunday, last Sunday we talked about, about the difference between relief and restoration. That when someone is needy, and we all know needy people, and a lot of us can be needy. Uh, we don't like to admit it, but we can be needy. And, but there's a difference between offering someone relief and offering them restoration. When someone you know, is broke and they need $20, and you give them $20, you're offering them relief. And that's okay sometimes. But if you're constantly offering relief, but not offering restoration, you're not helping. You're actually hurting. And so there's a difference between, and if you would like to listen to it, you can go back to the website. Relief is immediate and temporary assistance, where restoration is bringing someone back to their God-given potential. One is fast, one is slow. We talked about three prayers. Number one, God help me to give people what they truly need, not what they want. People always tell you what they want, not what they need. And we need to give people what they what they need, not what they want. Number two, God help me stay out of the way by continually rescuing people from their consequences. We do this with our children all the time. There's consequences at school and we jump in and we rescue them and really the best thing is to do is just let it play its course. We do it all the time. God has put a system in place, you reap what you sow and we need to let that play out. Number three, God help me remember that I'm in need too and that you are always the answer. The truth is we all have needs and God is always the answer. Today we're going to be talking about, about and this is going to be uh, maybe a little bit difficult, uh, but we're going to be talking about those people that are manipulative people, that like to manipulate. And the truth is before you start judging people, we all do it. And we just do it in different ways. Some people do it by raising their voice, and why do they do it? Because they're trying to manipulate the situation in their favor. Once when I was flying, and then there was, the, they overbooked the plane, and there was the man in front of me, and he was, you know, he obviously was a businessman, and he was at the counter, and, and the, the lady was like, sorry sir, the flight's overbooked, and he's on his phone with his secretary, and he's yelling at her, and he's yelling at the lady across the desk, and he's like, I put... 400,000 miles on this airline last year and he's yelling at everyone and she's just sitting there she's like well there's nothing I can do sir it's it's uh, and he was trying to manipulate her to control her with his voice to make her do what he wanted him she wanted him he wanted her to do so he doesn't get a seat he leaves I walk up and I say oh today's a really hard day she's like yeah people think I own the airline I think <laughs> Like, I make up all the rules, and I overbooked, and I don't book tickets. And I said, oh, yeah. So we chatted back and forth. So I said, what are my options? And she's working away. And then finally, she just slides me a first-class ticket across the counter. She says, you're going to be in first class today. I said, what about him? She said, not him. <laughs> <laughs> and we, 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 we can all manipulate in different ways. I mean... It's just to yourself, how many of you have ever felt manipulated? I mean, it's a bad feeling. But the truth is, how many of us can admit that we have manipulated someone? So today we're going to talk about how to deal with those that manipulate and control. Because manipulation is all about control. It's about how do I get what I want? And we're going to recognize that this has been a problem since the beginning of time. In Mark chapter 6, you don't have to turn there, but in Mark chapter 6, there shows two different women in the New Testament who manipulated and controlled Herod. If you know the story, and maybe you don't, but you can look it up in Mark chapter 6. Herod was throwing himself a big birthday party. <coughs> oh, I mean, that's weird. And all these people were there, and most likely they, they've been partying, a lot of people have been drinking maybe. 
And he said to the daughter of Herodias, I want to see a little dance. I mean, she must have been a good dancer. How many of you think you're a good dancer? No, me neither. I mean, this is amazing. Must have been a good dancer because she dances and he says, I'll give you anything you want up to half of my kingdom. Whatever you want, you can have. So the daughter went to her mother, Herodias, and said, Mom, what do we ask for? Herodias hated John the Baptist. She hated him. And so they thought, what are we going to do? What are we going to ask for? How are we going to manipulate this situation to get what we want? And they decide they want the head of John the Baptist. Give me the head of John the Baptist. So they basically took Herod, they backed him into a corner, and they said, you said this publicly, you promised we could have whatever we wanted. And he ended up doing something that he didn't want to do, and he took the life of John the Baptist. They cut off his head and put it on a platter. They manipulated and controlled. In the Old Testament, Genesis 25, you read about two brothers, Jacob and Esau. And you can look that up, Genesis 25. Esau was the older brother, and he had the birthright or the inheritance. Jacob was the younger brother. He was ticked that his older brother had the birthright, and he wanted it. Esau went hunting. He killed a deer or some kind of animal. He came home, and he was like, I'm hungry. Jacob, the younger brother, was cooking up a pretty sweet bowl of stew. The older brother said, I'm about to die. I'm so hungry. Give me some. How many have ever been hangry? <laughs> ever make a bad decision when you're hungry? And I said this on, on, on Wednesday, and I'll say it again. If you come home from work and you are in, not in a good place and you think you're going to make some bad decisions, sit down, have something to eat, take a moment, and a lot of times those emotions will pass. The younger brother goes, gotcha. You want some of these fresh vegetables and this beef stew and all the things that go with that? You've got to give me your birthright. I mean, he must have been pretty hungry. And the younger brother cornered the older brother and he tricked the older brother out of his birthright. He manipulated and controlled him to get what he wanted. The most tragic, perhaps, is a story in the Old Testament about Delilah and Samson. And, you know, I can remember hearing about this story when I was just a little boy, but you can look that up. It's in the Old Testament. If you don't know who Samson is, he was this strong dude in the Old Testament. And his power, because he had taken a Nazarite, his parents had taken a Nazarite vow, his power had come from his hair. And the Philistines, the enemy, wanted to know what was the secret of your strength. So they sent in a lady. Just a helpful hint. Men are dumb. <laughs> and they sent her in, and she seduced him. Now, he tried really hard to fight. Actually, she seduced him. He said... It's this. It wasn't that. And that happened a few times. And it didn't work over and over again. But she didn't give up. This is what the Bible says in Judges 16 15. Just, just a hint for us all today that if you keep flirting with sin long enough, it will get you. He said no a bunch of times. But he kept going back. Judges 16, 15 says, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? Manipulation. How could you say you love me, but you won't tell me your secrets? Then she bats her eyes at him. <laughs> if you really loved me, you would do this. This was the third time you've made a fool of me. You haven't told me the secret of your strength. And then in 16 it says this. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day till he was tired to death. There's a lot of jokes there. But I'm just going to move on because I want to get out of here alive. 
The King James Version says she vexed his soul unto death. Anyways, it went on and on until he finally said, I can't take it anymore. Kill me. Cut my hair. Here's the secret to my strength. There's this common problem in these three stories. Is when we allow someone or to control us or manipulate us, we end up surrendering the direction of our lives to someone besides God. See, God has a direction for us, and when we let someone manipulate or control us, it actually gets us off of that path. And sometimes, like these stories, really in the wrong direction. I mean, how, to manipulate it, how does manipulating work? You just got three things, the common things that people use to manipulate if you're taking notes. Manipulators love to use flattery. They love to use flattery. Flattery means they love to say, you know, you're so amazing. You're the best. Everyone, everyone works with that one person, you know, that always goes to the boss. You're the best. You're the greatest. What a great presentation. You want to be like, because they're like, there's a term for that that I, I don't think you can say in, in church. But it's about brown and it's a bunch of stuff. But they use flattery. We all know that person at work. You're the best boss. You're the best. Or the guy says to the other guy, you know, hey, you must be working out. Or, hey, baby, I love you. Let me sweep the floor from you. That's what men do. But they're only trying for one thing. <laughs> well, let me do the laundry. You can figure out what that is. <laughs> How do you know the difference between someone just being nice and complimentary and flattery? It's flattery when someone is trying to get what they want. <laughs> Number two things people do is manipulators use threats. They'll say things like, if you do that again, I'm going to hang up on you. We're not going to be friends anymore. If you do that, I'll never forgive you. Or, if you do that, I'm never going to call you again. I'm not coming to your party if you do this. You know what? I thought I could count on you. But I can't. Oh, I, you, you, everyone's heard this one. Oh, you said that you were a Christian. If you don't do this, you're not going to get this. Manipulators also, number three, use guilt. They say, after all I've done for you, you won't do this one thing for me? Oh, you call yourself a Christian and you won't even help me? You... Draw a line with someone and they say, you know what, that's all right. I'll just be here by myself alone for the rest of my life. Like I said last week, we have people that drive through town and they stop and they, they want me to buy them gas because they're on their way here or there. And I've got to figure out if I'm being manipulated or if this is the truth. And, and usually if I have to say no, it comes out pretty clear. They'll say, that's okay, me and the kids will just sleep in the car. Because they're trying to guilt me. We all have people in our lives that try to make us feel guilty. Your mom or dad might make you feel guilty about not visiting them. Your kids might make you feel guilty. If you love me, you really would, but obviously you don't love me. And with bribery, threats, and guilt, many good people, usually unknowingly, are pulling at the strings to get to do what they want you to do. What do you do when you recognize that someone is trying to manipulate you? How do you break the power of manipulation and control in our lives? We're going to do it again. We're going to offer three different ways. Because it's important to, for our relationships, no matter what they are, if they're marriage, if they're friendships, if they're work relationships, if they're school relationships, that they're led by God, by His Holy Spirit. 
Here's the number one prayer. I want to pray, God, help me recognize when someone is trying to manipulate me. God, help me recognize. Because let's be honest, many of us have been in dysfunctional relationships, whether that were friendships, relationships, doesn't matter what it is, so long that we don't even recognize the dysfunction anymore. That people are manipulating us and we don't even know it. And we need to pray, God, help me to know if I'm being manipulated. And we don't even recognize it. It's just this unhealthy dance that we do. They come to us, they want something. They lead, we follow. And we don't even recognize the threats or them making us feel guilty. But the truth is, they're trying to lead us with their best interests, not God's best interests. We see a really interesting story when Jesus was opening up to his disciples. I can't imagine how, how vulnerable or how open he had to be. He had been with them for so long, and for three years, and then he had to, 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 to give them this information. He had to open himself up. Have you ever been in the situation where you have to open yourself up to someone? Well, this is what Jesus is doing. He takes his inner circle of friends, those who he's been doing life with, and he's going to say to them, here's the reason that I came. He's going to put everything on the table. Here's the reason. I got to give my life. They're going to beat me, and it's going to be really bad. But I'm doing this because God sent me. And on your behalf, I'm going to give my life. Then I'm going to die, and I'm going to be raised from the dead. In one of his most vulnerable moments, Jesus puts out his cause, he puts out his purpose in front of the disciples. And then in Matthew chapter 16, verses 20 to 22, something interesting happens. From this time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. And that he must be killed on the third day, be raised to life. Now in verse 22, Peter tries to take control of the situation. And manipulators love to have control of the situation. What did Peter do? It says Peter took him aside. And he takes him aside and isolates him. And he begins to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. That will never happen to you. I mean, we all know those that are have, know those in our life that are manipulators, and they, and they don't have our best interest in mind. But Peter actually did. He didn't want his friend to die, and he said, "No, this is not going to happen with you." We all know those who, who are intentional. Maybe an abusive husband who uses power and threats to control their spouse. It may be a wife who withholds something from her husband to manipulate and control. It might be a bully who threatens younger and smaller kids at school. But often, maybe even most often, manipulation isn't from someone who dislikes us, but it's actually from someone who loves us. And they just think that they know better than what God knows. And this was the case with Peter. He says, hey, Jesus, I love you. I don't want you to die. And if you really think about it, Peter had good intentions. He was, but he was standing between God and what he wanted for his son. And he wanted to manipulate and control the situation. Peter does have good intentions. He says, no, no, I don't want this to happen. And this happens to us. No, I don't want that to be your life. You can do something better. Or people say, no, don't do, don't do that. Do, the, do this. They might even have good intentions. But they're standing between you and what God wants for you. How do I recognize when someone's trying to manipulate and control me? We feel guilty. 
and you find it hard to say no. Some of us, if we look at our lives, your desire is to please that person, to do whatever you want, and it's often born out of guilt. Parents do this. They have guilt from something that happened a long time ago, and then that person is able to manipulate them because they feel guilty. And this guilt or this belief is that you're the only one that can solve their problems. No, you're not. Only God can. If you say no, or I can't, or I won't, then you begin to feel guilty. Here's a fail-proof test. If you're in a relationship and you think someone is manipulating you, just say, I'm not going to do that anymore. And if that person ditches you, they were manipulating you. We've all been there. They cared about you, they wanted this and that, and the minute you said, listen, I'm not doing this anymore, they went and found someone else that they could do that to. The second thing is this. You come, we're being manipulated and it causes us to compromise our values to please others. That's how you know you're being manipulated. You compromise your values. You may be a sweet girl and you're dating a guy. And he's good in so many ways, but he's pressuring you to do something that you don't want to do. And you're like, no. And then he's like, yeah, but I love you. And he's trying to manipulate you to do something. You'll say, you know what, there's hundreds of other women who will. And then what happens, you compromise your values. To someone who loves themselves more than they love you. Or your friends want you to go to the club or go to the certain movie and you're like, you know what, I don't want to go there. This isn't good for me. A lot of bad stuff happened last time. And they're like, oh yeah, you're a goody two-shoes. Oh, you're a Christian boy now. Or Christian girl. You're too good for us because you're holier than that. See, they don't hate you. They love you. They just want you to come but they're manipulating you. And before you make the decision to let someone lead you away from what God has asked you to do, you need to pray. God, help us know. Help me to know. Is this someone that's manipulating me? Because they could be standing in front of what you have for me. What do you do when, we all know people that kind of back us into a corner, and in these stories we talked about in the Bible, they're all backed into a corner, but what, what do you do? You've got to have a plan. You've got to think of yourself first. Is this the best for me, what God wants for me? And you need to come up with an alternate plan that's on your terms. I have friends, you know, that, 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 that found Christ, and there was things that they really believed they shouldn't do anymore. And they would have friends that would ask them to do those things. And they said, but you know what? I really want to tell my friends about Christ. I really want to, to witness to my friends. And if I don't hang out with them, who's going to tell them? And I always tell them the same thing. Come up with a plan, but it's on your terms. Don't let them define what you're going to do, where you're going to go. You make those decisions. Then you can have a good time and still have influence. Here's the second prayer. God, empower me, give me courage. The resolve or the will to put healthy boundaries in place. This doesn't mean being rude. It's just about putting a boundary in place to say, here's the new rules. And in verse 23, you can't put a bigger boundary in place than Jesus does. Peter says, no, I'm not going to let you die. <laughs> Jesus turns to Peter and says, Get thee behind me, Satan. He was making the boundary. You are not going to get in the way between what my father wants. Get behind me. Just a bit of advice. The next time your wife or your husband tries to pressure you into something, do not, I repeat, do not say, get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> I 
mean, that's a better. He said, listen, you're not going to get in the way of what the Father has called me to do. He says, you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have the mind of the things of God, but the things of man. You won't control me and get in the way of what God wants. We all have been in public where our kids have thrown a fit. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to control and manipulate the situation so they can get this or that. The next time you're in the mall and you see a parent and their kid is throwing a fit, first things first. First, say a prayer. Say, thank God it's not my kid. Just do that. Second of all, instead of looking at them, you know, over your glass, say, oh, my kids would never do that because we all know they would. Why don't you do show them a little bit of support? Just be like, Go by, give them a fist pump, saying it's going to be better. They'll give them some NyQuil. When you get them. <laughs> don't say that. Don't say that. But we all have a friend. And maybe your friend, you're going to have to tell them, you can pout, you can hang up on me, you can threaten me, you can walk away. But I want you to know that I love you, but that is not going to work for me anymore. You've got to put a boundary. Your spouse may raise their voice at you and you say, you know what, you can't do that. I used to be a person, I, 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 I still struggle with this, but I, I, me and Penny were having a discussion yesterday, and she's like, why are you raising your voice? And I'm like, I'm not raising my voice. But a few years ago, she just said to me, you can't do that. You can either talk like a big boy, In church life, there's people who try to manipulate you. I've had people in my, in, my, in my ministry that have given me something and then later and later said, well, remember the time I gave you this? Now you should. But the truth is, when someone's trying to manipulate or control you, they're, they're standing between you and what God wants and they're trying to control the outcome of your life. But it's probably a person who really loves you. But they're trying to impose their will instead of God's will. And that's a problem. They may even have good intentions like Peter did. But you need to say there's new rules. I'm not going to let you control me. Because I want to be under God's power, not someone else's. Here's an interesting quote from Craig Rochelle. It says this. If you let someone else control you, you are committing the sin of idolatry. Idolatry is when you put something or someone above God. Anything. If you let someone else control you, you are committing the sin of idolatry. You need to let that sink in. Why is it important? Because if you let someone else control you, you are putting something or someone else above God. You're putting someone above God and allowing that person to maybe misdirect you away from what God really wants. God help me to recognize when someone is trying to manipulate me. God empower me to put healthy boundaries in place. Number three, God help me to see my own need to control and surrender everything to you. Listen, it's easy for us to sit here and say, yeah, I know so-and-so and Bob and Sally, and they're manipulators. Listen, we're the greatest. We all are manipulators. God, help me to see my own need for control and manipulation, and I surrender everything to you. We all know those people. I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me. I love to be in control. I can stand up here and I can speak and or I can be in front of a crowd as long as I'm in control. But if I'm in a crowd, I went to a dinner theater a few, few, few months ago now, probably a year ago. And we're in the crowd and, this, and the waiters, waiters come along. This, you're going to find this ridiculous, but I'll tell you anyways. Waiter come along and we're talking back and forth, all of us, and he comes to me and he says, Sir, we have this part in the show where um, we, we need someone from the, uh, the audience to help us. Would you help us? I said, No. 
He's like, really? I was like, no. He said, oh, and, he's, and I had been joking with him earlier. And he's like, ha, 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 ha. So I'll call you up. This is why I said, listen, sir, if you call me up, I want you to know I will not go. He's like, you're serious? I said, yeah. He walks away. My wife lets me see you realize you do that to people all the time. <laughs> See, but the very thought of being out of control freaked me out. I'll do anything for a while as long as I'm in control. But the truth is, many of us are like that. We do things we do to our spouse because it helps us control them. Now, no one's going to admit that out loud, but we do. We want to control our kids. We like to be controlled at work. We want to be in control over money so we don't listen. We don't take budgeting advice because that's my money. We like to control our friendships. Why do we do this? Because I'm afraid to surrender to someone or something else. And number two, the truth is, and we wouldn't maybe admit this out loud because it sounds bad, but because we believe that we can do a better job than God. And so we won't surrender control. And if you want to be controlled, chances are pretty good it's because you're afraid of letting go. And you believe that maybe you can do better than God. Well, you can't. And neither can I. And we try to control and manipulate our lives. Yeah, it's important to recognize when people are trying to control and manipulate us, but it's just as important to remember when we're trying to control and manipulate God. I know it's hard, but it's the truth. We all do it. God, if you do this, then I'll do this. We've all prayed that. God, if you get me out of this bad situation, I will never... We can call that what it is, in our minds that makes us feel better but it's manipulation it doesn't work but that's what we're trying to do God you have favorites why them and not me God if you get me out of this last mess then I'll tithe see some people take control of your life through manipulation and idolatry putting others above God but the often we need to understand and turn the light on ourselves that often we don't surrender our lives fully to God because we want control and we like to manipulate our lives. The truth is this, we believe in a monotheistic, meaning a one God, but we live like we believe in a polytheistic, many gods. We believe there's one God, but we live like there's many We know that there's one God that's on the throne that should be on the throne of our life, but we live like there's many. And often it's us. It can be work, it can be our kids, it can be our marriage, it can be hobbies, it can be desires, it can be money, it can be fame or popularity, it could be Netflix, it could be our preferences, it could be sin. We elevate lots of things into the place that God should sit. And the truth is we do it because we like control. I hear people all the time, this God thing doesn't seem to work for me like it works for you. First of all, God doesn't work for anyone. He's God. And I hear people all the time, this God thing doesn't work for me. I'm going to tell you a little secret. When you remove yourself from the throne, and put him on the throne. The God thing works for everybody. But the problem is we think we're better. Now we wouldn't say that because no one's going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm a better God than God. No one's going to say that. But with our actions, that's what we say. God isn't something you add to your life. He is your life. He's not just something you do for two hours on a Sunday morning or an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. He is your life. And when he is your life, 
it changes everything. As long as God is an add-on and you are still control, and something else owns your heart. You cannot manipulate him. You cannot control him. You cannot outsmart him. He knows every thought. Saying, God, you are number one, does not make him number one. Any more than me saying, I am skinny, makes me skinny. Saying he's first doesn't make him first. <clears throat> Putting him first makes him first. Running your decisions, your money, your life, your relationships, your will through his, that puts him first. Say, get thee behind me, Satan, when someone tries to push you off the track. See, we can't manipulate him. We can't control him. We can't outsmart him. Living like he is number one is the key. Every decision, every word, every dollar, every relationship, every action, every thought. And when we elevate God to the place he belongs, then and only then we see the fullness of what he has for us. Because attending church does not save us. As long as we're under our own control, you will not live in the fullness of what God has. Dr. Phil says this, how's that working for you? The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. There's many people in this room, you're sitting back and you can remember the years from high where you've tasted and you've seen. In closing. Just Scott's been fine. Everyone else can just stay with you. And you've tasted and you've seen that the Lord is good. Now, slowly over time, you've taken him from the seat in your life, and you find yourself always going back what you had before. You can't get back what you had before unless you put him in the place that he was before. can't just add him to your life just to take the edge off. I mean, you can. But you can't get back what you had before when you tasted and saw that the Lord is good. Until you put him back in the place he was meant to be. Let me be clear. I'm not telling you that it will make life easy. It'll not telling you that all your struggles will go away. But the God of the universe will walk beside you through the spirit. See, we, we often like to turn it on those people. And it's important to recognize if we're being manipulated. But the truth is, we need to search our own heart. Say, God, I need you to be first. We're just going to take just a couple of minutes. And I'd ask everyone just to close your eyes quietly. I'm not sure how you would close your eyes loudly. Just quietly close your eyes. And just pray. And say, God, 
I need you to be first. I've tried this my own way. But not only am I being manipulated by others, but I'm manipulating you or I'm manipulating others. God, I need you. I don't need a part of you. I need you to be number one on the throne of my life as king. Because I'll never have what I once had until I serve you how I once did. Maybe that's just you rededicating your life to him. Maybe you're here today and you say, Troy, I don't know God. I know about him. I want you to know that there's no magic prayer. That it's just admitting you're a sinner. That you need a savior. And that you are saying, you know what, I want to die my old self. I don't want to live as Christ would have me to live. If you're here and you say, Troy, I want to pray either one of those prayers. I want to either rededicate my life or I want to give my life to you. I want you to be first. God, I don't want to try to control my life. I want you to have control. And you need to know that if you pray this prayer and nothing changes, then nothing changes. But really, in a way, Pray this prayer and you mean it. Everything changes. So if you are here this morning and you either want to rededicate your life or you want to give your life to Him, I'd ask you to be brave and just stand right where you are. Don't be shy today. I've been coming to church a long time, but Lord, Jesus is not Lord. He's just a safety net. I want him to be king. this prayer after me. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I need a Savior. God, I want you to be king. Not me. Not my desires. Not what others want from me you want for me. God, come into my life and be my king.